the student research in algorithms and processing two session. So I am Kudu Pina, I am associate professor at the Pennsylvania State University. So I'll be chairing the session today. Uh, we have uh, in the last minute, uh, we, the computer showed on the screen outside that three software council were actually the only one managed to get a replacement for the talk, so we'll be in good shape. Uh, our first speaker uh, of today is Omar Imran, who is an undergrad, um, and he'll be presenting on deep learning on trajectory images, and I'll talk a little bit about him. He's from Carleton University. Uh, is he, he is in his fourth year of pursuing his bachelor's in engineering at Carleton University. He's working under the supervision of Professor Raman Rajan, whose research interests are in machine learning, deep learning, power classification, vision grids, and object detection. So let's welcome him, please. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be presenting um, our project on deep learning on trajectory images. So this was my, mine and Santosh's uh, fourth year uh, project uh, in our undergraduate degrees. Um, we were supervised by Professor Rajan and Professor Doris Swami, and along with help from Defense uh, Research Development Canada. So just an overview of what we were talking about. Just uh, first we'll talk about the tracking, then uh, the machine and deep learning models, and then some optimization and then questions. So as I mentioned, this was our fourth year um, undergraduate project for our, uh, our engineering degrees. Um, so the objective of this project was to classify whether unmanned aircrafts are either rotary or fixed wings based on their trajectories. So a trajectory is basically just the path of the of the aircraft and we use these to basically classify. So the attempt was to increase uh, public safety in sensitive areas such as airports. We've seen that um, when drones come near airports, they pose a risk and this needs to be solved. In order to simulate a radar or a sensor tracking uh, algorithm, we use StoneSoup. StoneSoup is basically an open source framework to um, uh, simulate radar tracking and it was developed by Five Eyes to do this. And so basically one of the ways you can use StoneSoup to um, track a drone is to give it the GPS data that is readily available. Um, you can just download it after you fly the drone and then you can simulate how a radar would actually track that drone. After we uh, used StoneSoup to um, simulate the radar tracking, we took these estimates and developed machine and deep learning models for classification, whether the trajectory was either fixed or rotary wing. Well, and I just want to mention, while we're using this in the application of fixed or rotary wing drones, it can be applied to other applications such as self-driving cars or you know maritime target classification. It's just a trajectory at the end of the day, and there's a, just an idea of whether it's fixed or rotary wing or it could be something else like pedestrian or stuff like that. So there has been previous work done um, to classify whether uh, drone is fixed or rotary wing. There have been different sensors used, such as like video sensor cameras. In this case, we used a radar-based sensor because it's longer range. Um, it's better in uh, bad weather as well. Um, our work is based on previous work done to analyze GPS telemetry data and trajectory information, but there was no actual uh, false alarms or stuff like that that we added in and we used this in our work. Um, classification has also been done using an SVM and an X-band radar and also using images and power spectral density and transfer light. So the first thing that we need to talk about is what's the difference between the two classes that we want to um, classify. So a fixed wing drone is uh, basically like an airplane, like it behaves like an airplane. Um, it has stationary wings, it covers longer distances, and it's also more rare. So this is actually reflected in the data set as well. Um, while rotary wing drones are probably more common, most people have probably seen these before for like video, uh, using to create videos and stuff like that. Um, they're slower than fixed wing drones and they can also hover at one point. So it's really important to um, dis clearly di distinctify how these two things are different because then we would need to create appropriate features for our uh, machine learning algorithms. So a quick overview of our StoneSoup uh, framework. So basically we wanted to create simulations on radar tracking. In a real world environment, you wouldn't have the GPS data of a uh, of a drone, right? If it's like not cooperative, you would have to track it using some sort of sensor. So the truth, uh, the truth, the ground truth is seen here. And you basically, we create detections based on the ground truth. 
And using these detections, we use an updater and a predictor to create a trajectory. And so to, in order to make this more realistic, we needed to add false alarms and misdetections. And you can, let's talk about this on the next slide. So the false alarms are basically points that are not associated with the target. They're meant to fool the sensor into thinking there is a, a object here when there isn't. So it's meant to make the trajectories more realistic, but they also, it could cause trajectories to be worse off, which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to simulate a real world environment. And also we wanted to simulate misdetection. So on the right here, this is, this is basically a whole trajectory for 15 minutes, but in a, like in a real world tracking scenario, you wouldn't have the entire 15 minutes continuously uh, tracked. You would have some detections that are missed by the sensor. So we accounted, I think, around 10% of our detections were missed. And uh, so this was also meant to create real world scenarios as well. So once you have all the detections, you need to create the trajectories and you need a hypothesizer to do this. Um, so there's two main algorithms that are used to, basically if you have a previous point and you want to find the next point, you need uh, an appropriate hypothesizer to do this. So there's a nearest neighbor one, which basically is a simple algorithm. It uses the next point as the closest one. Um, but we found that this could be uh, leading to track seduction. So it would cause inaccurate tracks if there's a lot of clutter um, close to the ground truth, and it would, lead, it would lead the track off the ground truth, making the actual trajectories inaccurate. Um, so here is where the probabilistic data association algorithm comes in, the PDA. Um, so it basically uses probability to determine, okay, whether is this track, is this, sorry, is this point associated with a track or is it just another clutter point here? So it's soft association because the next point may not be the one closest to it, but it is more resilient to uh, track seduction. So here's just an example of uh, track seduction here. Now on the right, you can see that when the clutter points are very close to the ground truth, uh, I'm sorry, on the left here, obviously. Uh, on the left here, you see when the clutter points are so really close to the ground truth, the track actually goes off, and this is not what we need in our uh, basically our data because it, it leads to more inaccurate detection, inaccurate and an inaccurate data set. So on the right here is with the probabilistic data association algorithm. You can see that the track stays on the ground truth, and this is uh, what we used in our simulations for radar tracking. So just an overall uh, simulation, uh, it's like the summary of what we did in terms of using stone soup to create simulations. Um, first, we read in the raw GPS data, this was the actual flight path of the drone. And this is in an uncooperative scenario, as I mentioned, you won't have this. So this is where we used um, potential detections here. You can see that there are points um, here. Uh, here. Uh, so there are potential points, but they're not actually associated. So you don't know where the drone's heading, it's just a bunch of points cluttered together. And then at the end here, using an initiator and a hypothesizer, you have the actual trajectory, which will be our inputs to our machine and deep learning models. So now that we have the output, I just wanted to quickly go over what's actually in the output. Um, you basically have the estimated latitude, longitude, and altitude, and the speed in those directions for the, uh, the length of the trajectory that was read in. But you can see here on the right uh, in this, uh, in this table, this is around 15 minutes worth of data, but we wanted, so 15 minutes worth of data is pretty like, uh, it will be unique to a specific flight path. So it's not really useful to classify based on the entire flight path. And this is why we split up the data into 40 second time segments. So this would be much more realistic. And this would be considered like a sub trajectory. So you would have 40 seconds and then another 40 seconds, stuff like that. So then we can create um, features for the machine learning models. And using the sub trajectories, we can map the points the X and Y positions and create images for our deep learning models. So uh, first off, we wanted to classify uh, the drone, I mean the subtrajectory based on the actual uh, min estimated speed and positions. So we use the average, minimum, and maximum for each subtrajectory to create features. And then uh, we classify based on this. So the assumption, as I mentioned before, the dis distinguishing factor between fixed and rotary wing drones is that fixed wing drones would be faster and covering more distance, and this should be reflected in the data set. And so we tested three different types of models here, a support vector machine, a k-nearest neighbor, and a decision tree, and the hyperparameters are here, a linear SVM, up, uh, k values, stuff like that. And then we evaluated these models based on four metrics, accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score. So as I 
briefly mentioned before, you can also map the X and Y positions from the subject to create an image here, stuff like this here. Um, so this would be 40 seconds worth of time segments. And the pixel values, you can see here, the pixel right here is uh, much more intense. So this means the drone might have well spent more time here. And this would be key in like, let's say in a rotary wing drone, if a drone is hovering at one point, which may not happen in a fixed wing drone. So as I was uh, as mentioning before, you have the fixed and rotary wing drones. You can see the differences here are quite apparent. The rotary wing, I mean, the fixed wing drones are longer and uh, they cover more distances and the rotary wing, the rotary wing sub trajectory images are smaller. So this would be uh, another key distinguishing factor in for our neural network models so that they can classify based on this. So just, uh, we, we use a CNN, so we have our image here, um, to create a neural network model. So this is a generic uh, CNN, um, so no transfer learning or anything like that. But, uh, so we have convolutional max pooling layers, a fully connected layer at the end with a sigmoid activation function, since we only have two classes, and add an atom optimizer as well. Then this basically determined whether the image was a fixed or rotary drone. So uh, as I quickly mentioned, and briefly mentioned before, that we actually had a lot less fixed wing samples than rotary wing samples. And when we uh, initially trained and tested the machine and deep learning model, we noticed that the fixed, the overall accuracy and all that was great, but the actual like accuracy for our fixed wing class was very low. So we experimented with two class imbalance techniques here, synthetic minority oversampling uh, over techniques MOT and CNN data augmentation. So, so SMOT basically uses the nearest neighbors uh, to a fixed wing sample to create a synthetic example. And this is uh, basically how we oversampled the minority class, which is a fixed wing, and tried to improve our models. Uh, so this is much more uh, preferred than just duplicating, you know, let's say if uh, X, duplicating fixed wing models. So then it would lead to the models being overfit. So if an X position is at like 20 or something, it may not just be a fixed wing drone. But if by synthetically creating more examples, it's, it's much less prone to overfitting. So again, CNN uh, data augmentation is basically just adding more images to the data set. So this was for our neural network model. So we used um, rotating and flipping for this. Uh, and so basically we added three different uh, synthetic images for each fixed wing sample to create a more even playing field basically. Uh, one technique that's more popular for data augmentation is stretching, but if we stretch or shrunk the actual image, then this would actually imply that, okay, this one's going faster than it should have, or this one's going slower. So this was not used in the study at least. So now with the results, so we can see this was our first iteration with no um, data augmentation. You can see that the overall accuracy and precision are great, but you can see that the recall, so the accuracy for the fixed wings are not too good. So this is why we actually uh, went for these synthetic and oversampling techniques that we used. So we can see here with the actual um, data augmentation techniques that the uh, that the four metrics that we were measuring stayed relatively the same, maybe a little drop, but the actual classification for the fixed wing recall were much was much higher than it, and this was a very positive result as well. So just a summary of what's been done then. So we classify basically fixed and rotary wing drones based on their sub-trajectories. To create realistic simulations, we uh, resource the open source framework called Stonesu, um, and we added false alarms, misdetections, all that. And then we use these sub-trajectories to create machine and deep learning models. And we also went back and then improved the fixed wing classifications using SMOT and data augmentation. So this was uh, around, the, this is like the first time we actually ran this project. Obviously there's more work to be done here. Uh, the main one is that what if a sub trajectory isn't actually a drone at all? What if it's a bird or something? So this would be uh, something that needs to be added in. Another thing that needs to be done is majority voting. So we could uh, basically use all the different classifiers we have and make a, make a classification based on that. Um, different data augmentation techniques could be used, such as um, GANs or Q-shot learning even, like Siamese neural networks for the minority class that we have. Um, so transfer learning, we didn't really look at this year, but this could also be a new thing that we could add in. And then we also, we had one sensor, one uh, target. You could potentially add more sensors for better, uh, better tracking, or even you could add more, um, more actually like more targets as well, but this would probably require more um, data collection. So yeah. Thank you.
Do we have questions for Omar? We have plenty of time. Yes. Yeah, so those, so uh, once, yes, yeah, so those were clean, those were downloaded directly off the drone. Uh, so it was a, I think one of them was a homemade drone and the other was a DJI Mavic. So we basically collected it straight off. So there was no like, it was, so if we classify based on that, it's not, it's just a clean, yeah, clean track, yeah. Because a lot of times, obviously, Mavic or some other debris might be in the area with a little Yeah, that, yeah, you could, yeah, yeah, that would be, yeah. Yeah, very yes. Um, have you experimented with increasing your um, sub trajectory time to see if it yeah so, your accuracy? so yeah so if you increase it so we experimented with ten seconds and the accuracy wasn't um, as good as it is here. Sure. Um, we also experiment. <laughs> we also experimented with ninety seconds and the accuracy does go up. So we just found a sweet spot there and based it on that. Yeah. Yes, I guess for extension or corollary to that is how short a trajectory can you get away with because in many applications you want to know this answer very quickly. Yeah. Especially if it's a high speed drone that's approaching you, mm -hmm. you want to do something about it. Yeah. So if, if, if it might 15 minutes to by 40, that's about 20 seconds. No, no, so it's 15 minutes and the time segments are 40. So 15 minutes was for just one of them, as just an example. Some of the some of the flight paths were 10 minutes, but we each uh, flight path was just split up into 40 second time segments. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I mean, how short did you get this? Could you do this yeah. in five seconds or less? You could, but uh, <laughs> the classification numbers obviously would drop because you then have a shorter. So let's say, you, um, so in this like fixed spin example, you have a longer, uh, trajectory here. So if it's if you don't even actually get the entire thing, then it would be harder to classify, right? Yeah. Um, could that be shortened if you have like more classifications to help distinguish? For example, like you mentioned, one where it, it you can tell with the rotary wing, it may stay in one spot for much longer, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But uh, another classification could be that they can uh, change height and in Z position yeah. without yeah. changing X and Y much faster, yeah. the Z velocity would be higher. Yeah, so yeah, that would, that would, so the Z velocity is, I mean, sorry, Z position, so the altitude is not actually reflective in the um, images because they're 2D mm -hmm. representation, but in the right. machine learning, that's where, that's why we actually want to experiment with the machine learning model because we could add in the yeah. third dimension basically here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you're two, those two dimensional pixel maps, what are those, what are the dimensions of your pixel and the scale? Is that yeah. counts number of? Yeah, it's count. So I think it's uh, it was twenty nine by twenty nine. Yeah, the images were twenty nine by twenty nine. Twenty nine meters. Or? Uh, just like uh, <laughs> no, I don't know the actual like um, area of it or anything, but just like on like Python or something, if you like an image, it's twenty nine by twenty nine. Just like that. So your application is purely dependent on these images. Yeah, for the CNN, yeah. So you could add in, uh, yeah, that's another use that you could add in. You could classify based on the raw GPS data, right? I mean, sorry, not the raw, the output. So you could use a CNN for that as well, right? But we just want to see how an image-based classification would work. Oh, okay, because you know, things could happen, right? This is really a projection on a 2D space, on yeah. a 3D machine. So yeah. there could be confusion either way, right? I mean, uh, yeah, so that's why maybe like a majority voting thing would work better, because then you could have the machine learning and the CNN working together, something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very good, very good. Any other questions for Omar? Before we transition to our next speaker? No? Okay, well, let's thank you one more time.